homelessness and helplessness. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three-strike law, and then wants us to sing God Bless America. No, no, no. Not God Bless America. God damn America. That's in the Bible for killing innocent people. God damn America for treating us citizens as less than human. God damn America. As long as she tries to act like It's the motherfucking It Clown Podcast. For skeletons, it's a po- skeleton podcast. <laughs> Get uh, in the circus. Skeleton Andersley here. Skeleton Andersley here. Dude, the gain is fucked. This is way louder than I wanted. <laughs> it's so different. Now let's take the splitter off. Should we start again? No. Okay. No, we shouldn't start again. We're just doing. We're just doing this. That's punk. It is punk. Right. Yeah. We are kind of the. Me and people you, see we're us in cool real life, guys. <laughs> we're cool, but we're not like what you might expect. I own sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> I lo- I lost all of my. Oh, I actually am in the process of moving, and I unearthed all of my sunglasses. Uh, uh, but I don't feel I feel too self conscious to wear them. Well, welcome back to the show, everybody. I'm Alex Patak. Anders Lee here. It's me and Anders. Uh, Jake is recording a different podcast, and uh, we have a Pod wa- Save America. He's recording Pod Save America. Jake has sold you out for cold hard cash. We don't know what he's recording. Don't don't message me about this. <laughs> um, yeah, it's another week in Hell World. That it is. Um, Hellworld specifically for Anders because he's he's moving. Yes, I've been flipping through the DSM all day trying to look for uh, procrastination as like a thing I can blame my idiocy on. Is there like a procrastination designation for your boy? Because uh, I had two weeks, two weeks. Do you mean pack- like medically? Yes, that's what I'm looking like for. Like you're medically procrastinating? Yeah. I found out that supposedly a... a- an effect of ADD is that you procrastinate, but I, I feel like it's just a separate thing everyone does. Okay. Well, well, I don't know. I think I, maybe it's a uh, ADD. Uh, I think it's addendum. actually more medically anomalous if you don't procrastinate. Really? How many of people are there you know who don't procrastinate? Uh, you know, I was gonna look into it, but just didn't. Okay. All right. Well, tell tell them tell them about the moving. I just I had two weeks to pack of all, all of my stuff, and then I moved to D.C. I just took a suitcase down to stay with the GF and uh, didn't pack up all of my shit in New York, and then I came back this weekend, and I have two days to do everything. And so I got a storage unit. I don't know if I'll have enough time to get all of my stuff into the storage unit. Uh, I'm leaving at 3.25 in the morning on a train tonight, <laughs> And um, are I, you are you planning on just like not sleeping and going to work? I'm going to sleep on move? the train, and then when I get to DC, I'm going to have like two hours to sleep. So okay, that'll be a good amount. This is a punk week for us. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm bringing my bike and my You're hopping cars. <laughs> I'm bringing my bicycle and delivery bag on the train. I'm going to be covered in sweat at three in the morning. Try to sleep. And then uh, drag my booty over to my girlfriend's place at 7 when I get there. Probably be like, yeah, 7 a.m. Um, so I'm an idiot. Yeah. Okay. I could have gotten, I could have just not have had to deal with any of this. Uh, but I waited till the last minute. Because that's what this movement is about. Is we have, <laughs> seriously, we have, pro- like, we've procrastinated. It's definitely what the climate change movement is about. Yeah. We could have had, like, a. Uh, anarcho syndicalist revolution like 20 years ago uh it's and it's all our fault there's no other external factors from um that prevented us from doing this we could have had that instead we kicked the can down the road and so now we have one chance to elect a socialist and if we don't do it we are absolutely screwed uh this really is the last minute politically we have waited to the last minute as a species to survive. I don't, I mean, I don't even room. know if that's going to be the Green New Deal. We need to completely, we have the next, like now, we have the next like few months to start unraveling capitalism or the For, world is going to end. Our train at 325 in the morning. Hold on, I'm yeah. trying to extend out this metaphor. Okay, so uh, uh, our failure to create full communism now is procrastinating and we're only to blame. But who's been helping us 
kick the can down the road, the FBI. Whoa. Okay, so who are they in the metaphor? The FBI. It, yeah. In the metaphor, they they're like they're like a friend who shows up with weed. Yes, they're distracting us. <laughs> exactly. They've the classic us imagery of the FBI as a cool friend with weed. I mean, if there's one thing the <laughs> FBI has, it's sunglasses. Yes, they have even more than I do, and that's also how you know I'm in the FBI because I also own sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> An assertion no one has made yet, but I'm hoping to get. Get trending. What, so, I'm hoping to start it this week. <laughs> <laughs> this is something I've wondered about. Is like obviously the woke FBI is a joke, um, but could there be an actual FBI that was that was cool that like went after corporate crooks and white supremacists? All they did was inspect female bodies. <laughs> well, but they're also doctors, so it's helpful. Yeah, what if it's they, cool and helpful. <laughs> There's a shortage. Once we get <laughs> universal health care, there will be a shortage of gynecologists. And uh-huh. So we will need more. And the FBI. That's a, we will transition the program, yeah. the FBI, into becoming a health department. OBGYNs. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the CIA uh, is going to be something with the clitoris. I don't know what it is. <laughs> or, okay, not going there. Okay, or it's not. Okay, maybe it's a child care initiative action that would program. Be good. That or would it's be with the clitoris. De- <laughs> Department of Homeland Security. I'm not Security. in charge of these decisions. Department of Homeland Security. I'm the be... ambassador of karate. <laughs> <laughs> DHS would be securing all, however many seasons of the program Homeland for your viewing pleasure, everyone access to that <laughs> securing it the thing about uh, people in the future is they want to see homeland it's their favorite show yeah to look back at this relic of what an insane look world. we've come so far yeah hey, um, is that a lump oh look anyone can check that out <laughs> <laughs> uh what, what's going on this week um queer eye for the straight guy has come out against bernard sanders <laughs> what jonathan van ness of the hit show queer eye for the straight guy where uh, 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 a ragtag crew of queer gentlemen go and they fix people around America, uh, stealing David Spector's joke, mostly using money. <laughs> Have you seen the show? I watched one or two episodes. Yeah. So I mean, the the like joke everybody does is that uh, they go and they're like, "Oh, you you're a mess, and you all you watch too many sports, and your kids don't like you. What if we be- we made you a new house?" Right. What if we bought you an apartment? (laughs) (laughs) What if we gave you health care? Yeah. Yeah. David's line is, uh, (laughs) I was too straight to think of furniture. Um, (laughs) Yeah, man. I shouldn't be stealing jokes, but I was on tour with him, so I have all his jokes memorized. Shout him out. That's appropriate. You're shouted out, David. Shut the fuck up. Yeah. Um, Anyway, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, Jonathan Van Ness, who's the one with the long hair, has publicly endorsed Elizabeth Warren. Because he has HIV medication, and he says that he lost some of it and then had to replace it, and it was $3,500 even with super good health insurance, and he was like, this is why we got to get Liz in there. Who does not To really... do Medicare for all, which is not a thing she's doing. No. But she she has the branding for it, and um, that's more important than whether or not you're doing it. If you go to her website, it says Medicare for all. That's it. Yeah. But then it talks. And then proceeds to describe market <laughs> yeah. healthcare. I'm going to fucking shoot myself. <laughs> this is going to be the most frustrating uh, 12 months of our lives yeah. for the Democratic primary. Well, in the other vid they did. Uh, they did was, one in 2018, I think. I have it pulled up. Was that 18? No, I think it was. Was that it? Oh, I thought that was more recent. But N- they are talking. No, it's, uh, it's uh, from last. It's from February 18th, 2018. So this oh, is okay. about the old Bernie Sanders campaign, which is why in the video they say Hillary all the way. Yeah, which they still said in 2018. They um, have after she did she lost to Donald Trump. Yeah. Um which creates more slovenly straight people for them to fix. Don't you see? It's a fucking racket. Yeah. <laughs> it's the 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 slob to queer eye pipeline. They want to <laughs> keep it going. Well, they basically admit that they are not able to uh, take in his political message, uh, which includes things like Medicare for All, because of his aesthetic. His appearance is too frumpy. They think that his suit looks bad and that his hair is bad and that his lifestyle is bad. And then they compliment Ronald Reagan. 
Right. After briefly mentioning how he uh, did a witch hunt to gay people. or Which is kind of, you know, their whole thing. So you'd think that would be more important, but who knows? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, who am I to judge as a non-queer person? But, like, I mean, it's pretty... This I, don't, I mean, this is not representative of, as other people pointed out, the majority of of uh, queer people who... No! Yeah. But it is representative of their TV show. <laughs> yeah, and of people, POWs, people of wealth. Uh, <laughs> POWs? That's an old... That's what that I flag is who, for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's people like of wealth it's, MIA. It's, <laughs> where are they? They're on an island in Boca. <laughs> you don't, you're not allowed to know about it. I will say, uh, on the other Queer Eye video they dug up with, with all the cast... Uh, dissing Bernie for looking like a turtle ass bitch. Um, Tan France admirably stands up to four no nonsense queer eyes to defend Bernie Sanders. He's a little man. Yeah. Why don't you leave him alone? Look at his little suit. <laughs> <laughs> He's a nice friend of mine, he is. <laughs> I don't remember what Tan sounds like. I'm just doing general Cockney street thug. General Cockney. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, he defends Bernie Sanders and uh, clearly loves communism. Shout out to Tan France. You can come on the show anytime you want. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure it will be much less popular than any podcast you make independently, but still. <laughs> Damn, you're cool, man. Yeah. Uphold Tan France thought. <laughs> I mean, so this is, of course, it's frustrating if you're following the Twitterverse and the the mainstream media's coverage about the election so far. Uh, they're ignoring Bernie's polling, which is largely still putting him in second place. Um, but, like, I guess my thing with this is, it you know, with as addicting and dopamine um, rush giving it is to get into it with these people, and I'm guilty of this, it's... They're Warren just gonna supporters, be, you mean? Warren supporters, people who are misrepresenting this. The cast and crew of Queer Eye for the Straight. <laughs> just people who are saying Bernie's dead in the water. Um, like we could just get really mad at them and and show how wrong they are, um, or we Look could just like, wait till them for them to just be proven wrong in real time. Which, uh, if the campaign sets its uh, is 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 on the trajectory to do that, you know, because we, they are objectively bringing people into the political process who typically don't vote. And so you think Bernie Bernie still got this? You're not disheartened yet? I mean, I'm the wrong person to ask because I'm an optimist. I thought he was going to win last time. Right. I uh, shoot from the hip. Yeah. Uh, but like they're just going to get egg on their face. Like these are the same people who thought Trump had like no chance of winning. Uh, they've been wrong about literally everything. Not literally everything, but I mean, I guess under the new definition of literally, then yeah, sure, that can be bent to... Yeah, to abstractly, everything. literally, everything. Yes. Uh, um, uh, no, I think you're right about that. I had a lot of talks with David about this in the 14-hour car ride from Kentucky to New York on Thursday. Did you pod? Did you record that? Did no, we didn't, content out of we it? didn't record it. Damn it. I had road madness, Anders. <laughs> it wasn't fit for consumption. <laughs> but uh, what we were discussing is uh, Biden support splintering off between Warren and Bernie um, with essentially um, gullible libs who who figure themselves progressive and are, for whatever reason, aligned with Biden going to Warren because she's the less left-wing candidate who is getting all this mainstream coverage. Or devil's advocate, old racist, I mean, not racist, old sexists <laughs> who will not vote for a woman, and that's why they're supporting Biden, Going in to Bernie because he's in second place. Well, but many of those people were who uh, voted in caucus for Hillary in 2016. Yeah. Oh, I'm no, but not them. I'm saying that you, the specifically because Biden support is with old people, right? Have you ever spoken to someone who's 65? Yeah. You get you get some sexists in there easily. Well, but sure, but uh, if they're voting in the Democratic primary, they're I don't know. I I would. Assume that they probably voted for Clinton last time. Many of them. Um, but what's interesting to me is the top two choices for, I think it's most, primary voters are Biden and Bernie, which to us makes zero sense. 
Um, but no, it doesn't seem like they have anything in common except that they're old. Yeah. But I actually worked with a woman like this who uh, is from Park, or not Park Slope, she's from Coney Island and has been, you know, waiting tables for 20 years. Uh, and she voted for Bernie last time. She was excited. She had the Bernie pin. Um, and then felt he got absolutely screwed by the DNC. And so she was her, bamboozled. Right. She changed her res- registration from Democrat to independent because of it. So she can't at the moment vote in the, the primary coming up. But when I last talked to her about politics, she said she was excited about Biden. She's glad he's in it. And I said, well, what about what about Bernie? And she's like, well, he's not going to... She didn't have a faith in the process. She basically didn't think that the DNC would allow him to be the nominee. So in that case, she might as well... I still don't understand why your next pick is Biden. Because that's who she thinks can win. That's who she thinks they'll anoint. Uh, so she's just already assuming that Biden's going to be the nominee and he's, he's the... He, we might but then well he doesn't him. need your support if he's anointed. Like, why would Because he, be he needs excited? to beat Trump. So she wants someone to beat Trump, and she doesn't think... But the whole point about the rigged game thing is that the Democratic primary specifically is rigged. The general isn't rigged because they tried to, you know, just play it rigged last time for anointing Hillary Clinton, and it blew up in their faces. Well, they can... What do you mean? They rigged the general? Or they no, I'm saying you general? can't rig the general, but you can rig the primary, so it doesn't matter if... You could rig both of them. I mean, I can't. I mean, this is not my view. This is her logic that... Uh, Let's not have her on the ma- podcast. <laughs> well, <but laughs> it doesn't sound like her ideas are good. She well, she's <laughs> represents a big swath of thought in uh, among primary voters or among, and among people who would vote in the primary but aren't. You know, like that's the logic of a lot of people. They, they, they would like what Bernie has to say. They are suffering because of capitalism, because of what... Uh, Biden will, albeit soften, but continue. But to them, it's a defense mechanism. It's like this is a shred uh, of a way of protection against uh, rapacious capitalism is getting Biden in there and taking out Trump. Uh, they That doesn't mean they don't want something better, which Bernie um, can offer. But the task now is to convince them that it, it can be Bernie and that Basically, if there's enough of us, they have to give them the nomination. Um, and, you know, like... What you do with canvassing and just general grassroots political right, action. Right, And sure. these are people who probably sure. wouldn't vote for Warren because she does it. she's kind of in the middle there. She's but not really... This like, is what I meant to bring up about the car ride thing that we were talking yeah. about. Is So Biden's support does seem like it's falling apart a little bit. And uh, if you were to take for granted that he will just fuck up and say the n-word on stage during a 1940s flashback or some period as his brain melts in real time in front of us his support depreciates for whatever reason do you get the mainstream support the the things that that make your friend from coney island assume he's going to be anointed is the mainstream support and uh elite media support going next to a moderate with shitty numbers or is it doing the smart thing and moving over to warren who has reformist policies that liberals can work with to knock out bernie well there's the mainstream media support and then there's the actual voters and i don't think they're aligned necessarily uh i think that's happening already the mainstream media is yeah sort of pushing the narrative that warren's the gal to beat um, Look at this gal. Be, like I said, they're just going to be proven wrong in real time because the the grass there is a grassroots movement. There's a working class base. There is an backing Bernie, movement. and you can't say the same about Warren. You know, and that's and I uh, that follow up to the show we did last week about Ryan Grimm's new book. That's something that you know I guess wasn't as apparent when the book came out, um, and something he sort of misses. I think is that. Uh, yeah, Warren had support from sort of the net roots, net roots nations of the world, you know, the the fire dog lakes and whatever. But those are, and they support some good things, but that's largely like sort of a middle class uh, movement. And it's based on, you know, online petitions and stuff. And that's great. They get, we're able to accomplish some things. But what we really need is the support of, uh, 
of the working class and of, of people who have to take a shower after the job, people who, and actually done in a way that is material, people going out there, uh, going door to door. Um, and as people have pointed out, that's who can actually, that's who's actually going to show up in the winter uh, when in the freezing cold in places like Iowa and door knock, it's probably not going to be these sort of armchair progressives uh, who are like, you know, ain't having no Bernie, quote unquote. Um, it's going to be people who have actual skin in the game. And right now they, they aren't convinced by by Warren. It's between Bernie. It's between for many of them. It's between Bernie and Biden for even more of them. It's between Bernie and not voting at all. Okay, well, you have more faith in the grassroots movement power than I do, I guess. But you know what's very unfortunate is now you know from watching the second Queer Eye video that if they did have to pick between Biden and Bernie, they would pick Biden because he wears better suits. He does wear nice suits, sure. But that's... but that, again, He looks that's good. Like an ali- I don't necessarily think that that is a plus. Like, not to get too focused on the fashion thing, but I remember... In Minnesota, uh, whenever there was like a Senate race or governor race, there 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 was actual attention to what the candidates were wearing, even though they were guys. And it was always like, well, who had the shittier uh, shirt on? Who who had more wrinkles mm-hmm. in their shirt? Who was looking? Andrew more Yang spiffy? is wearing a tuxedo t shirt. That's not allowable. <laughs> yeah, they want. I mean, and Bernie has that sort of. Uh, on lock, like he shops at Kohl's famously, like he, you know, he's he's taking money from Kohl's. You heard it here first, people. He's in the pocket of big Kohl's, right? He's in the pocket of the coal train. <laughs> the coal. <laughs> um, oh, that was the other thing that happened this week. Is that picture came out of Yang being goth? Oh yeah, dude. If his policies weren't so wrong, like his personality is very strongly appealing to me. He's like a young, he's a young goth gentleman. You, you don't think that was just a one-off Halloween thing? No, he's fun. <laughs> he's yeah, funny. He's a fun who wife who's goth up. with him. Yeah. He, he dresses up, but he doesn't do it like Justin Trudeau, who uh, <laughs> more and more blackface photos came out this week. A blackface video. And the, the thing about uh, the blackface Justin Trudeau scandal is uh, there are so many of them. And granted, I am not the target audience to be offended by this, but I've stopped finding them offensive because of how many there are. <laughs> because I've already seemed to... If I like the third or fourth one you found, you're like, oh, yeah, he's getting good at this. <laughs> he's done a lot of blackface. He could professionally do blackface. Yeah. Well, as we were talking about on the last episode, like, I don't think he was doing it. I mean, it was wrong to do, but I don't think he was doing it to mock. I mean, kind of, but he was doing it because he's just that oblivious to the historical ramifications behind that. And he thinks he's like a, you know, transcends race just as an entity. He thinks he's sort of like a spiritual... Sometimes when you like hang out with unfunny people, they'll do very offensive things yeah. as kind of like their go-to joke. And I think right. this might be his, like, ah, I don't know what I'll do. It's blackface again. <laughs> I want to make a splash at this party. I, I still got my Black Flanders outfit. <laughs> I will go as Black Flanders. <laughs> Oh, I hope everyone likes me. I'm the son of the former president. <laughs> and you like the coal on my face. <laughs> I would love to see Andrew Yang as Black Flanders now. Yes. That is the, the uh, twist we're waiting for, yeah. is Blackface Yang. What when is-, is it coming? We know it's out there. <laughs> if you're listening and you have access to these photos, share them. <laughs> Stop waiting. The time is now. Yes. Okay. Well, we've just talked some... Some uh, some election beat stuff. Um, so if you t- if you're an anarchist and you just tuned into this, uh, fret not. We have a a nice tasty interview for you. That is, we don't talk about any of this horse race bullshit. We are talking to uh, like a, a movement guy who who has a very interesting perspective on the role of the Zik music on <laughs> on the radical left. How it pertains to records how you know he's he's uh, created this really awesome encyclopedia of different record labels from over the years that are um actually pretty broad left like there's some socialist social democrat but there's also anarcho communist anarchist like all kinds of stuff connected to real on the ground struggle right he's a real jazz daddy <laughs> you guys are gonna love it yeah 
So let's go to that now. And it's podcasting. <laughs> All right. We are joined by Josh McPhee uh, here in studio in the Patek household. Um, Josh, welcome to my house. Thanks for coming Thank by. Yes, Josh is a designer, artist, archivist, uh, and can I call you an encyclopedia-ist or encyclopedian? Sure. Would that apply? <laughs> the uh, term is encyclopedian. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you don't meet someone who compiles an encyclopedia very often, so it's a true honor to be joined by one. Mm-hmm. He has authored an encyclopedia of political record labels. Um, and this is a book uh, I've been skimming through. It's really interesting. It's got basically... Well, well why don't I let the author describe the book? Um, I can describe the colors. It's very dynamic. You got your pinks, your blues, your yellows on the front. Uh, and it's also a sort of vertically designed book, which I like. Yeah, um, it's kind of like the uh, the ABCs of Socialism Jacobin did. Yes. In terms of like stature. Yeah. It's like a tall, thin boy. <laughs> it's anyway, thin boy. now that you know all about what this cover looks like, <laughs> why don't you tell us about the book a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was actually kind of going for like a bird manual, like that kind of oh yeah, tall, thin with a um, shiny but um, kind of viscous cover. Uh-huh. <laughs> this is glossy. viscous. Yeah. <laughs> so I can what, see that that comes across. <laughs> <laughs> so what made you uh, want to write this book? Well, or compile this encyclopedia? I should as say. we were talking about before um, the red lights went on, uh, I grew up. Punk, like many of you, and I grew up in a DIY punk scene. Uh, going You're to a shows. black diaper baby. <laughs> black flag diaper baby. <laughs> <laughs> Dirty diaper. Um, so making flyers and t-shirts and record covers and all that, I have absolutely no musical acumen at all. Um, but everything around the music um, was my jam. So, Did you ever try? Oh, it's did you bad. dabble? It's bad. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Shame, yeah. never we'll even, cut this all out. I promise. <laughs> never, never even made it into a fake band. Never mind. Uh, um, oh, into damn. a real one. Um, so, so it basically, as you know, at least in the late eighties, when when one was a, a a punk, it was it was pretty much like do or die. Like you listen to punk, and that's what you listen to. Yeah, and so. All other music was like largely anathema, was not allowed. Uh, and so I grew up basically thinking that like folk music was Joan Baez played at the wrong speed or something. <laughs> and had, Savage. had no, like literally didn't even dawn on me until I was in my 40s that the word folk in folk music referenced people. Oh my God. So folk music is people's music. Um, and I was, oh, it's that's interesting. So, and I, I wrote a little bit in the introduction here, but um, a friend of mine, Sylvia Federici, who's a yeah. sort of well-known um, autonomous Marxist feminist theorist, has a lot of stuff, as you can imagine. The you know seventy years of amassing ephemera around all of the projects that she's worked on, mm-hmm. and um, her and her partner George have reached the point in which they're sort of buried in it in their apartment. So I was helping them clean out a little bit, and she just, out of this closet, yanked out this stack of seven-inch records and said, here, do you want these? And I was like, sure. And I look at them, and it's all these 1960s and 70s political groups in Italy that had put out records. So Lata Continua, which is sort of like a you know, within the far left, a relatively well-known sort of autonomous Marxist group from Italy had a daily newspaper at a, at a, at one point, um, was like one of the largest of the extra parliamentary and sort of left groups in Italy put out records that were theme songs to their political campaigns. So uh-huh. she, she handed me this stuff. I had no idea it existed. Totally blew my mind. And that kind of started this sort of uh, archaeology project. Do any of the theme songs jump out to you? Well, what's funny is the most of them are written by a musician named Pino Massi, um, who sort of uh, came out of a, the Italian version of the sort of griot, like a figure that travels around with a guitar and performs songs. Mm. Um, and a significant number of them are just literally written on top of Bob Dylan tunes. Oh, um, no. <laughs> oh, no, they stole from Bob Dylan. So, th- I mean, there's like basically the sort of weaponizing of 
traditional American folk music to use in these other political contexts. So it would be like the song Hurricane, but the lyrics are changed to be about like the Workers' Party of sort of or like yeah, blow, blowing in the wind, but the but the lyrics are all about how we need to take over the city and everyone should go on red strike. Needless to say, these are all <laughs> these are all deep uh, deep cuts of albums. I'm guessing. <laughs> well, the records actually came in the newspaper, and there was mm. a law in Italy that existed until I don't know how at what point in which newsstands legally had to carry across the political spectrum. Really? So, like. If you because sort of a fairness doctrine, but for it's kind of like in a lot of European countries, um, things are more centralized uh-huh. and more controlled. So, when if you were going to publish a paper, it had to be registered with the state, and if you were registered, then a newsstand had to co- had to carry all of the registered daily papers. They maybe only needed to have one copy. But they had to so like basically you could get lot to continue it everywhere that any newspapers were sold and it came with a record in it that mm-hmm. had the theme song for the well, okay for the yeah. all right i'm picking up what you're putting down now <laughs> but you, you do write about sort of feeling by the early 2000s like kind of a disenchantment with the way uh, music has gone political music has gone sort of the end of of the record as a mass form of uh media um what, so what was that experience like like going from this um material item that that was distributed in this way that involved a lot of um praxis a lot of community building uh going from that to as you write about sort of this this uh alienating sound coming out of computer speakers well i mean i think my uh it's connected to my like larger life uh track which i think is true of a lot of people that i grew up in a very embodied um social, cultural, mm-hmm. political community. And I struggle to maintain that, but to maintain my life, I've had more and more of it is staring at a screen every day. I yeah. think like a lot of people. And so if you really care about music and you want to listen to music, you end up listening to it while you're working, which is like basically your computer is just choosing tracks from your hard drive and playing them. And at a certain point I just realized it's just background music. It actually yeah. became meaningless to me. Um, like it just wasn't even, I wasn't even noticing that it was there. You couldn't tuck any of these songs into a newsstand. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have the same text. No, no. Um, and they also are complete. Their dematerialization means uh, also a decontextualization. Mm. So the context in which they were produced, um, what the way that they were originally distributed, all of that is now gone. Um, as uh, one of a billion uh, kilobytes of music streaming through, uh, you know, some streaming service. The algorithm decides that you're listening to a lot to continue a song and the next thing should be Taylor Swift and that's just the way it is. <laughs> so did you feel like before that that records were going to be a sort of integral part of like a radical left movement and that this was sort of like a, a, a knife in what could have been a uh, did you think that this was basically like a a field of defeat for the radical left when the the record kind of <laughs> <out>? <laughs> no one talks about this one defeat this, this one we have so many one. wonderful defeats across all spectrums that uh the music one is just completely glossed yes. over first you know they got to Lo- rosa luxembourg and then they got to the record <laughs> they went back um. to her house and smashed her music collection no i mean I, even i my 18 year old self didn't take myself that seriously. Um, But I do think that there's a lot of evidence that records played important roles in different movements. Mm -hmm. Um, Certainly the civil rights movement. Um, The civil rights movement was at the forefront of using all kinds of emergent technology in the 1960s. And one of those technologies was the relatively easy access to pressing music onto, or sound actually more broadly, onto the substrate of a vinyl record and distributing it far and wide. So the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, CORE, Congress of Racial Equality, they they all pressed records. And a lot of those records are their kind of choral groups singing sort of reinterpreted gospel songs, which in a way isn't all that different than Pino Masi reinterpreting Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan songs. Um, But then a, a lot of those records are actually field recordings. 
Mm. So there are recordings of people singing while they're marching in the streets. And then those recordings get sent across the world. And then people not only are purchasing and sort of sending sort of value back to the movement that way, but they're also putting that record onto a turntable and entering into the world in which it was recorded. So there were songs and there were also civil rights movement podcasts being pressed. Basically. Yeah. Basically, you could buy a Fannie Lou Hamer podcast and listen to her give a speech. And I would if I could. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And and this is pretty actually pretty amazing to listen to now i mean the fidelity is terrible um but that makes it seem that much more real Mm -hmm. um it has a sort of cast of authenticity um and of really feeling like you're there if you could have gotten these like mlk speeches on flac could you imagine the effect (laughs) they'd have just the clear bit rate um actually i think that you're that joke is getting at a key point here, which mm-hmm. is that the reason why those records had power is because there was an audience that yeah. was interested in not just listening to them, but acting on them. Mm. So I think like uh, an MLK wave or flack file now, it actually, it has its lack of impact has all to do with the fact that it's not motivating anyone to actually enact anything. It's not that the words aren't, don't carry the same power is that the power and the words were always intrinsically linked to the audience. Yeah. But now we're obsessed with sort of centralizing individual identities. And so the crowd is lost and the figure on the stage is all we ever see. Um, and what in a way the going back and looking at these records shows is that there was a much more direct connection between those things in the past. Sure. I guess I don't really see that tied to like sound quality, though. That seems more of just like a. I I, I always feel disenchanted uh, uh, or no, not motivated politically, if anything, just because you hear so many calls to action constantly right. all the time that eventually you just lie down and let them drip over you. Absolutely. Yeah, but uh, you but you are not a a luddite. We should be clear. Um, you have eventually. I mean. You talk about the disenchantment, of course, but uh, do you feel like now there is a lot of potential in digital forms of communication and the internet for sort of organizing and and cultural production? Absolutely, on the left? absolutely. Yeah. But I and and it's actually been nice to see that um, the fetishization of that seems to be subsiding a little bit, and there's a recognition that the the digital works best when working in concert with the analog. Mm. That like movements that are the most effective don't learn a lesson and then forget it. They learn the lesson and then they keep it in their pocket. And so, you know, there were years where it was almost impossible to find a poster Mm -hmm. because everyone was just, you know, you just put your thing on Facebook. Well, we're seeing a return of the poster, not just because people fetishize the paper and screen printing and all of that. I mean, that definitely happens, but also because there's a recognition that when you can put something up in public, you're actually potentially reaching audiences that your digital medium would never reach because, you know, our digital communication is almost entirely cocooned at this point. See, I'm glad you said that because I'm flyering for my comedy show in two days. (laughs) And really, I just hit a wall after the first 10 minutes of doing that where uh, I just convinced myself no one is going to see these things anyway. (laughs) And it really just sucks the life out of an afternoon. But no, we can do this. Okay. (laughs) I I have a new question. Uh, In your opinion, what is the worst iPod? The worst iPod? If you you were going to pick one. Do you mean like... I like specific Apple products, or like we're talking Zoom. Oh, you, you know, can pick any MP3 Tamagotchi. player, I suppose. Like, do you have any? Pre- I know. So you have done a lot of research into the record player. <laughs> sure, it's in the book. Do you have any opinion on like newer stuff like that? Like the iPod Shuffle, I think, is an insidious device. The little teeny one. The, the teeny one. You can yeah. never pick what you want. You're <laughs> right, only just, a victim. You're never yeah. an actor. Yes. You can pick, but you have to switch it to the the tracks and like. And hit next, 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 next before you get your. See, that's no way to live. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think they continue those anymore. <laughs> but you do talk about sort of the revival of the record today. Like it's it's coming back into production, but a lot of the circulation is happening at places like Whole Foods. It's not necessarily with the same uh, radical zeal that it once had. Although you know, there it's it's a it's, it was a medium. It wasn't. Obviously, wasn't all from the left. Um, but why all. do you think that resurgence has happened? 
I mean, I think it's connected to what I was saying about the posters. I mm-hmm. think that people want, um, they want to have the physical object in right. a way. And, and I'm not entirely sure. I think that different people have different sort of psychological relationships to these things. So I think some people probably actually want to feel like they're getting some physical thing for their consumption. While some people obviously want the exact opposite. They don't want to carry that stuff around. I think some people have a nostalgia or a maybe inherited or second wave generation nostalgia for the packaging. I mean, you can fit an immense amount of artwork and information on a gatefold sleeve for an LP. I mean, you're literally looking at a one foot by two foot double-sided canvas with the inner sleeves for each of the records. I mean, there's just the ability to convey an immense amount of information, whether that's, you know, a massive picture of Michael Jackson that folds out to, you know, to being six feet tall and into the record, or whether that's six petitions to get people to try to stop a nuclear power plant from opening Mm -hmm. in, you know, Oklahoma. Um, And I think that there is some, I think, recognition and valuing of the art form of the vinyl record. That's part of why it's come back. And I also, I mean, I, I'm, I was around during the tail end of the, it's, it's original life. And so I have that experience. So I I can't speak to why a 20 year old would want to have a record collection right now. Neither can I. Um, But as, as someone who's worked in bookstores and seen just a God awful number of copies of catcher in the rye get sold every (laughs) single day. Um, sometimes I think people just want accoutrements to their life that make it look like they're interested in X, you know, it's window dressing. A talisman. Yeah. A physical object. Yes. You know where's a, where are very haunted places in America today? I was just on tour, and we went in three different DVD rental stores. <laughs> we talked about this a little bit on the last episode we did together, but uh, it's like a, like a museum. You go in there. There's no one in there. Why would there be? There's no reason to be in there, but it's wall-to-wall thousands of movies. Thousands. And the artwork on them, ones you've never even heard of. You just get to... Re- it's my like favorite kind of place to go where you just go and physically touch uh, 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 f- fraught ideas that never yeah. should have been born and you would never come across. Well, that was my, that was my first job actually was at a video store when I was 16 and it was like sort of an independent place, a lot of foreign movies and I got hired there because as a kid I would go every Friday and it would take me like 2-3 hours to pick out the right movie because like if you choose the wrong one then your night is is fucked. That's you it. know. And if they don't have what you want then your night is fucked. There's no way that's the only way you have. But it's just watching. fun to be at the store. Yeah, it's a good place to hang out too. This is what we're talking about, right? Artwork, the- man. <laughs> Six feet, Michael Jackson's. That's taller than Michael Jackson. Yeah, but the and also like more the Michael than Michael. It's more Michael than Michael. <laughs> <laughs> but the the experience of being at a space where other people are interested in the same thing. Um, are there too? That that's a something that's really hard to recreate just online. Um, but that experience isn't necessarily a a productive or progressive one. Um, you write about that this is uh, specifically it, it's called an encyclopedia of political record labels, but that doesn't mean you're including like uh, the Commonwealth Club of Virginia, Daughters of the American Revolution records. This is a left wing. Uh, project, a sort of um, a history of it. But so, why did you choose to to make it leftist? And what were the criteria for the labels that you included? And what were your reasons for not um, doing a, a broader project? Obviously, that would have been an insurmountable task. But um, do you have plans at any point for doing like sort of a reactionary version of this, just to kind of keep tabs? <laughs> On what they're into. <laughs> Compendium of fascist records. <laughs> well, I, someone's got to do it. <laughs> I, I actually do have a folder of of clips of right-wing labels oh, sort of okay. waiting to... I was thinking about if this does if this book does well, that maybe adding, adding an appendix Ooh. Um, that has some of the right-wing stuff. I mean, it, I think arguably... I mean, I don't think that it's as interesting, at least to me, but I think it is useful for understanding how the right organizes mm-hmm. to understand the way that they distributed ideas. And so... 
I think it's a useful thing. It it just was too much for me yeah. to deal with on top of what I was already working with. I also, I, I, I say it in the introduction, I also define political um, by being... My ideal record label was one that was putting out music that was directing directly connected to actual struggles that were happening on the ground. Mm. So like the example that I use in the book is that I don't include Epic Records, even though they released The Clash's Sandinista, because Epic Records could really give a shit about the yeah. Nicaraguan Revolution. Meanwhile, there were like Nicaraguan solidarity committees that were putting out records that where they were actually channeling the money directly to, for people to be able to buy guns to fight against, you know, the CIA backed regime in mm-hmm. Nicaragua. So to me, that was much more interesting. Um, so it's not even so much about the music being political and it's more about the apparatus around the music and how that was being used and how it was being deployed and, and the vinyl record as a piece of agitprop or propaganda. It's interesting you bring up the right-wing record labels because you don't really see reactionaries having the same lust for music that way, um, right? There are a lot of... Uh, there's. I'm from St. Paul, and I know there's... In South St. Paul, uh, it was like Storm... Not Stormfront, but some... Well, there was Resistance Records was yeah. the giant right wing kind of Nazi punk label. Right. And that's how they organized before the advent of the internet and the alt right was basically the same way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that's dropped off at all? I don't know. I think of punks and I always think of like lefty. No, I think it's, there's always been, you know, like skinheads in the eighties and like, that's been a a point of contention in the, in the, I mean, I think it's, I think it's dropped off a little bit in the U S particularly with the rise of the alt right in the sort of, um, the the new creation of the nerd as sort of paragon of right wing purity. Sure, because um, they lost skinhead. That yeah is no longer the. But I, I think it's in Europe. It's huge. Like in Germany, there's a label. I think it's called Rockarama, which is a huge right wing oi record label. Mm-hmm. Um, Eastern Europe, it's massive fascist punk scene. Um, I mean, oh, in no. some of those countries, there's still literally, <laughs> there's the kind of like Antifa alt right battles that are happening in Portland. Mm-hmm. Like that stuff's happening at a much larger scale, you know, in the former Yugoslavia and, and yeah. you know, that stuff is historically like par for the course with the, like we don't get that in the US, but this, these street fights and clashes mm-hmm. have been going back for a hundred years almost. Um, you can only get like Washington Post to cover the Yugoslavian punk Antifa <laughs> battles. Yeah, then we'd get it. Then what? <laughs> Did you have sort of a favorite uh, label that you didn't know of already that you discovered in this process? I mean, I think there's a lot of them. Uh, one of the labels I've been trying to actually track down some of the the principles uh, for when it started, but there was a label that actually came out of the student come worker revolt and in Paris in 1968. So in May 68, there were a group of singers that sang on the left bank during the, the marches and the street occupations. Oh. Uh, one of them was a, a woman named Dominique Grange, who later would marry Jacques Tardy, who's kind of a famous car- comics artist. Um, the Jacques Tardy. <laughs> some people may, I mean, they, this is people that were connected to the Charlie Hebdo when it was still a left wing project. So, you know, she record she recorded a couple seven inches that were released in 1968 while the protests were still going on. Like half the country was on strike. The first uh, one that was put out, the cover was actually, I believe, printed by the Atelier Popular, which was the workshop that was in the occupied art building where people were printing all of the famous posters that came out of May 68. So they slipped in this record cover. Um, I have a copy of this cover that's screen printed on one side and has a stamp on the back. And those records were the first records for this project called Expression Spontané, which went on and put out, you know, you know, roughly a little shy of a hundred records into the 1980s that are kind of all over the place. Um, it starts with a lot of stuff that's really like kind of international struggle focused. So there's like a record of songs of revolutionaries in Oman and there's a, um, field recording from Vietnam and 
There's uh, political folk songs from Mexico. There's all this stuff. Um, and then it gets more into popular, kind of more rock and kind of early punk stuff into the 80s. Uh, and then a ton of traditional French folk music. Mm. Um, but it, they're really interesting because they actually were born, literally born out of struggle. And then unlike a lot of the labels in the book that put out one record or two records, they actually eventually formed into an, a record label that continued to put out music for another 20 years. Um, and now have sort of disappeared. I mean, I don't speak French, so it's really hard to kind of unearth information. And all of my attempts at trying to track down the people that started the label have not gotten any responses. But someday I will actually like be able to sit down and interview them and get the full story. But when you look at these early records from 68, you could swear you're looking at punk records. It's it's really the the birth of the sort of punk aesthetic i feel like was in these records that are these like one color really quick screen printed down and dirty covers and then inside they have like kind of collaged comic book and stuff that looks super proto punk um the music doesn't sound punk at all but the motivation behind it, the actual titles of the songs. Literally, if you didn't know, you would think without listening to the record that you were looking at a 1980s French punk yeah. record. Wow. But this is, you know, a decade earlier than, you know, the Sex Pistols even imagined themselves. Do you think the Sex Pistols knew? They knew about such things? Well, I don't think the Sex Pistols knew, but I think Jamie Reed, who was the designer behind the Sex Pistols, who did all the artwork, who put the safety pin in the Queen's nose, absolutely knew because... A dangerous thing to do at the time, because the Queen was very powerful. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Well, Jamie Reed and Malcolm McLaren were roommates in art school, and they actually housed striking students from Paris who came and stayed with them in 68. So there is a direct, literally a direct connection. It's a pipeline. Mm. Yeah. It's a punk pipeline. (laughs) Uh, last question, because we unfortunately Josh has a cat allergy, so we have to let him go. <laughs> Chew. <We've been laughs> the, the, the most goth thing we could do is kill Josh in my apartment. <laughs> um, we're sitting here in front of a coffee table, and to me, this is, I'm a fan of coffee table books. Do you? Uh, is this okay if I call this a coffee table book? Is that something you sure? Are okay it's, with a, it's, a it's a little. It's a little. It's a little. Well, perfect because c- coffee tables are usually too big. They're big books, um, but you see this. You, you write in the intro that you don't necessarily want people to sit down and read this all in one sitting or leave a bookmark in it. Um, how do you want people to experience the book? Is this the Bushisms of punk records? <laughs> <laughs> I think that there's a lot of different ways to engage with this book. One, I think a lot of people maybe is, is a great way is to just, you pick it up because you think it's interesting and you sit it on your shelf and then all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, someone was telling me or I was listening to a record and this thing came up. I look on the internet, it's actually not there. Then you go and pull it off the shelf and look in the index and there it is for some strange reason communist soca music came up in your conversation at the bar the night before and you found the three communist soca um Mm -hmm. record labels and then you can sort of like start your your search more from there um but i also think that there's a way like my my hope is is that this sparks a lot of additional research maybe from people who have like more fortitude than i to follow the little threads outwards um one of the things that's been fascinating about this project was how much seeing how much the record has been used as a way to preserve and promote um, languages that have been marginalized um, within primarily Europe but in other parts of the world. So you have record labels that only put out records in Breton um, or only in you know in Basque language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's literally dozens of examples of that. Um, and so there's a whole narrative that about the way that music um, and recorded sound is being used and has been used to preserve and, and sort of put forward um, national identity, which I think is really interesting. Um, there's a ton of records and really, really amazing records that were made by Berber musicians. And I didn't really know what 
Berbers were until I was working on this project. Which is I don't sort of, know what they are now. It's like a, <laughs> um, an itinerant kind of ethnic group that's pan-Arab. So there are Berbers that exist in Morocco and Algeria um, and sort of like across the northern um, edge of Africa. And um, I don't know the deep history, but basically there's a series of diasporan moments in which Berbers further traveled and they uh, have tended to be ghettoized and they have their own cultural traditions. And there's some of the most amazing North African music is created by Berbers and is super political because they're a marginalized working class community. And so just singing about their lives is this profoundly political activity. So like a lot of like Nawa music or sort of trancy Moroccan music is Berber uh, rooted, some Rai music from Algeria, things like that, that have deep sort of working class social commentary roots um, come out of a, a desire to articulate um, oneself in as a minority within a larger majority context. Right. Oh, they probably have wild Bob Dylan covers. <laughs> <laughs> um, more Beatles. It's more Beatles influence, really? actually, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you have a couple of events coming up if you're in the New York area. Um, when are those? The listeners can find out. October 4th okay. at Printed Matter Bookstore, um, which is like just climb yourself down off the high line onto 11th Avenue and... Um, Do the- not climb on the high line. <laughs> it's not safe. That would be punk, though. It would be very punk. Um, so that's uh, at 6 p.m. on uh, October 4th. And then on October 29th at Powerhouse Arena, I'm going to be uh, having a conversation with Johnny Temple, who is the publisher of Akashic Books, but also was in a number of um, influential punk bands from the D.C. area, from Soulside in the 1980s, and then Girls vs. Boys, and a bunch of other groups. Right. So. And where can people find you on social media? If uh, I am on Instagram okay. at uh, J McPhee, M-A-C-P-H-E-E. Um, I'm not on Twitter or Good. Well, we like the gram. People like could gram. Uh, physically send you a, a record. <laughs> yes. And that could, could be a good way. Of that would be great. And Write on a record and send it to me. <laughs> and Which, he, actually, it's so not to, you know, another story, but one of the things that was really interesting is almost all of the records that I've collected from Africa um, and a lot of Southern um, Southern Europe, a lot of Portugal in particular, they're always written on. People writ- have written their names on them. Doesn't which it ruin the, the sound part? <laughs> not on the, on the sleeves and even oh, on the labels. Okay. all right. Um, which speaks to, like, in different... Records mean different things in different places. And so if you are in a community in which... People don't have easy access to record players. There's not an easy way to get records. If you get one, you want to hold on to it. And so people literally have written their names, sometimes their addresses, on their records wow. um, in a way that you would almost never see in a record that from Germany or Northern Europe or even the U.S. Um, oh, crazy. So like cool. the record... These people are willing to dox themselves <laughs> yeah. for these records. So the physical record itself, I think, tells as much of a story as the what's recorded on it. Yeah. Um, and I'm looking forward to an, an audio version of this book recorded by by record from you. Uh, <laughs> but if or people want to buy the book, this is an important thing. Uh, e, sh- should they go to the website, commonotions.org? Absolutely. Or, okay, they can go to the website. And I assume you're selling it at Topos in Ridgewood? Probably. Yeah, hopefully it'll get okay. there. Yeah, Topos. And, Great bookstore um, to check out if you're in New York. Human Relations, Book Thug, Codex. Cool. All right. Josh McPhee, thanks for joining us. Thanks Thanks for coming on. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. And we're back. Wasn't that a good interview? Show was. Wow. I didn't know you could have so much fun on mic. Yeah. And off mic, he told me he's going to be at uh, a rhizome in D.C., I believe, on October 21st. So come out to that if you're in the D.C. area. Um, Off mic, he told me he's a Nazi. Well, that he, he did he not said to say. share it. He Let's said to not, say it on the podcast. No, he did not. He said say to that. leave it in he the cut not. too. Yeah, he did. <laughs> he, did he said to say, say it, then not edit it out because he it's did funny. not say that. He does have a <laughs> he does have a collection of Nazi like where they do their labels because it's good to keep tabs on them. Yeah, suspicious, isn't it? Yeah, where they make the records, where they print them. 
<laughs> there was a thing. In, I can't remember the name, but in South St. Paul, Minnesota, there's a, a Nazi record label, and I just I'm just imagining them like sharing an office building with some like syrup company, and just, like, <laughs> some nice old lady going into work next to like a bloody a blood eyed like skinhead. Right, right. Just German trying cross. to make fascism take off with. Rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Checking to work every day. Yeah. Oh, my wife is wondering if she can come home or if I'm still uh, <laughs> kidnapping Shout our out entire to apartment. Alyssa Kaufman, who has been <laughs> uh, the most tolerant uh, spouse you could ask for, right? Yeah. So much for the tolerant left <laughs> letting us record in my apartment. Uh, shout out to my wife again. Okay. Uh, is there anything we want to plug? Yeah, we got a, a live show coming up here in New York, October 12th. We do? Yeah, that's going to be at Littlefield. Uh, I believe it's 7 o'clock, and it's a joint show. <laughs> joint show. <gasps> Where'd you get this shit? <laughs> this is uh, Goth Socialist Strain. It's going to be with the... Antifada, our pals over there. We're also have some special guests. That's right. It's a sativa. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have Vir- Virgil Texas is on it, right? Oh yeah, yeah. We got some Chapo boys, and um, it's gonna be a lot of fun. We got also have a musician there, Comrade Barbie. So we're playing some tunes. So uh, if you get your Leslie tickets Lee now, from Struggle Session, yes, yeah, tickets are gonna probably sell out. So please get them now. And if you buy them now, they're only twelve buckarunos. But at the door, they're going to be 15 So get Ooh, on that, friends. Save $3. You deserve it. <laughs> and I think that's all That's all we want to plug right now. Follow me on Twitter at Patak Jokes. I'm no longer locked. I didn't get that job. So don't worry about <laughs> it. And I'm Matt Anders Lee here. And you can watch me on Redacting tonight. Yeah, man. That's a podcast. It's finished. It's finished. <laughs>